The United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. What do women really want? That depends on which women you ask. A discussion next on Utah Matters. Good morning and welcome to Utah Matters. I'm Dean Painter. You know, most people who have some interest in what's going on in the world have an opinion about the United Nations, and those opinions cover the spectrum. Most people don't know that shortly after the UN was created in 1945, it also sponsored a commission on the status of women. That commission initially set out to formulate standards to oppose discriminatory legislation and foster awareness of women's issues around the world. Nearly seven decades later, you can imagine the agenda has changed and expanded a bit. The Commission on the Status of Women, which just wrapped up its 58th conference, is a magnet for non-governmental organizations who believe that what the Commission does has a real impact on what will eventually become law throughout the world. These NGOs run the gamut in political, social, and ideological motivations. Today on Utah Matters, we welcome one group who participated in the conference and whose concerns might reflect many of those in our area. United Families International is based in Arizona, and you might say its mission to the United Nations was to help save the United Nations from itself. Laura Bunker is the Executive Director of United Families International, and part of her contingent is Tim Rarick, who is also teaches uh, from at BYU-Idaho. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be here. You're just back from uh, New York. How was the trip in general? It was good. It was very eye-opening. Yeah. Let's start with this. Let's assume that the Commission on the Status of Women is there to improve the status of women. What do you understand from the Commission's perspective to be improving the status of women to be? Well, the word they use is empowerment. They want to empower women worldwide. And this would include the influence of women, the opportunities of women for success. Um, however, that is growing into something kind of that it also includes freedom and freedom from consequences too. So. It's just interesting to see how it's changed through the years. Yeah. Uh, Tim, characterize the feeling that you had there when you uh, were meeting the groups that predominated this, uh, this commission. Well, I had to say that being a Caucasian American male put me in the extreme minority. Um, <laughs> the 90, 95 percent of the people attending this commission were female, understandably so. Um, but since they were from all over the world, I rarely even met an American, especially a male American. Uh, one of the things that kept coming back to me was that there are two different agendas and they're fairly, there's not a whole lot of overlap. Um, and some were pretty hostile to men and so mm. <laughs> I could feel that being a guy. Wow. So, uh, Talk to me about who was there and how you get there. Who gets on the commission? I assume that there are delegates from each country. How many countries participated or who didn't and, and how do you become a delegate to the commission? Well, there are, I, I understand there are 54 countries that are a part of this particular council. Why only 54, do you know? Um, I don't know. It's under the umbrella of the Economic and Social Council, and this particular commission meet, or convention meets once a year. Okay. And, uh, and those delegates are chosen on what basis, do you know? Are they assigned by the current administration that's, that's leading that country? Have any idea? I don't know. They're usually working with the ambassador's office somehow. Okay. So. Yeah. The ones that we spoke with seemed that they, there was a slightly different process in each country how they were chosen. And some where there was a civil war going on, there was a lot of unrest, so there wasn't seemed like a very strict process in place. We got to get somebody there representing rather than having this really rigid you know, way of bring this about. So. Yeah, and you, you mentioned in your document something about sort of, sort of institutional chaos. What, what was going on there? Is this, during the, is this the actual process of putting the commission together, getting the commission going? What, what do you mean right. by that? Right, well the convention itself is a meeting where all these delegates from countries come together and they spend a week trying to hash out the different language that will go in this document that will be produced at the end. And what felt like chaos was there seemed to be no rules in place on how this process happened. There were no elected officials, no constituents, and so there's no accountability. So, and some of the delegates were quite young. Did you notice that yeah. too? Yeah, surprising. Young people uh, coming together in this convention 
trying to produce a document and there was just a lot of arguing going on, disagreements on what should go in the document or not, and um, a lot of stalling tactics mm -hmm. happening and so that some of the negotiations that traditionally happen as a group, as a body, were happening behind closed doors and a lot of people were just waiting to find out what's going to end up in the document. What were the forces, what were the dynamics in that that were creating that, the delays, the, the filibustering? Yeah, I, w I mean, there, I talked about there was two different agendas there and, and uh, it was interesting as you go around the United Nations on the grounds there and then the different events that are surrounding the, the actual grounds of the United Nations you could see these different groups getting together and strategizing, including us, and strategizing. Um, and of course, a lot of them are ideological based. And so I think with the strategizing and with their meeting together and, and I mean, we're trying to do our own thing on our side and we think we're doing it in a professional way. Um, just, just as, and I should, we should probably say this, the people who are, have an agenda that's different than ours um, many of them feel like they're doing what's best for women and for children and for society at large. So, um, and I think that should be said because they didn't want to make it look like we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. Right. But. We were there because we believe that life is precious. Marriage is between a man and a woman. And that strong families make strong nations. There were other people there who believe different. They believe that um, people should have access to free abortion across the world, free contraception, comprehensive sexuality education for young children, and uh, special protections for sexual orientation and gender identity. And this is where these two ideologies clashed. Now, you're, an, you're a non-governmental organization. There right. were many there. I don't know how many, but uh, dozens and dozens. Right, and dozens. we are a part of a larger pro-family, pro-life coalition as well, so we weren't the only pro-family okay. organization there. But given that, and given what you've mm -hmm. stated as your reason to be there, how lonely or how welcome did you feel? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, for me, it depended on which event we went to, because uh -huh. uh, we kind of described it, but around, in and out of the, out of the UN, there's events of people who are trying to promote their ideologies or their agenda, um, what they think is best for women in society. And you go walk into one, you feel really welcome. There was one that um, a colleague of mine walked into. He was one of two males in the room. And the woman stood up to speak and she said, I don't know what these two guys are doing here, but I'm not changing my words just because there's two men here. And then she went on to, to really bash men over and over and over again and actually called the two men out. and then. Um, so it depends on which event you go to. And some of the delegates and ambassadors we met with were warm and welcoming and some were more cool. diplomatic and just cool. <laughs> I don't mean cool as in cool dude, I mean <laughs> more of cooled off. And, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. And as a woman, it was interesting to see the different kinds of women that were there. Um, some of these, what we would call radical feminists, are very aggressive and they would come right in my face and ask me to, um, they wanted to see my phone and see if I had any pictures of them on my phone and when they saw one they demanded that I delete it. Did you do it? Uh, yes, because they were bigger than me. <laughs> and then another woman came up to us as we were standing in a group and she said, you are impeding our progress. We want you to pack your bags and go home. So there's just this aggression there that we don't, um, haven't seen. Now tell me about the lips. Here's a picture of big red lips. Uh -huh. uh, what was this all about? Dozens of women were walking around wearing these masks and it says something, I think it's Spanish or Portuguese, about um, use your mouth against fundamentalism. So in essence what they were calling us or anybody that had a moral or religious perspective, they were calling us religious uh, extremists or fundamentalists or terrorists. And they um, they were saying that they were against us that way. Yeah, the sign says, my rights right now. Right. Uh, I saw some of those signs. Uh, and you, incur you encountered this quite a bit? Yes, more towards the end of the week. How did they know where you, what your position was? That's a good question. I don't know how they knew, <laughs> but they sure seemed to come right over to us. You, weren't, you didn't have red lips I on, guess I guess not. <laughs>
No, I have to say, though, that, and this sounds really biased, and it probably is, but I think we were smiling a lot more. Speaking of lips, we just, we were happier people, and um, several people we ran into talked about how pleasant we were. Now, we weren't being fake, but maybe they thought, there's some happy people over there, we need to make them <laughs> ticked <laughs> off like we are. Um, and I don't mean any ill will toward that, but that just, that was my observation, and five of my students said the same thing, yeah. so. As part of that, what, what turned out to be the most strident issue that was being pushed at the, at the commission? I would say abortion. Mm. Many women feel like abortion is their key to freedom worldwide. And this was really, um, really pushed. Abortion was, on demand. And, and what, who were they pushing against? Because it's legal in this country. Well, it's any, in, any I, government. I it's legal in most countries. Any governmental regulation of abortion they feel like is impinging their fundamental human rights. And, and where were most of these people from? Could you tell? All different countries. Yeah. Like, all, over. all over the place. Yeah. Finally, this in this segment, given what you've described as institutional chaos uh, and the way that this is laid out in the documents, I've read through the, the draft document of their final communique, I guess. How is it possible, and you've, you've said this and others have said this, how is it possible that this could possibly end up influencing laws in sovereign countries? Mm. How does that work? United Nations creates documents that become what they call soft law. In other words, um, the delegates from the different countries will take these documents back home and often when legislation is being drafted in their own countries, they will pull phrases or quotes from the United Nations documents so it becomes legislation in their countries. It also directly influences how people think culturally in different countries. So it's kind of a two-way approach, but it does have a great effect. Laura Bunker and Tim Rarick are with United Families International who were at the recent United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. We're going to talk to them about what came out of that commission and how their group, which w included uh, several university students, uh, how they address that. We'll be right back on Utah Matters in just a moment. Laura Bunker and Tim Rarick are with United Families International. We just returned from a United Nations uh, Commission on the Status of Women in uh, New York at the United Nations. Laura, summarize for us what became of the commission in terms of what it accomplished, what it spoke to this session? Well, this commission tried to produce a document that traditionally has been agreed upon by all the countries and all the parties. However, this one was um, had so much controversy in it, it went to a chairman's text, which meant the chairman of the convention um, just said this is the way it's going to be and we'll write it this way and he pulled in some compromises from some of the countries but in the end it wasn't agreed upon by all the countries and some of the countries expressed rather clear hesitations and reservations on this wasn't what we wanted. Uh, who was there with you on your, on your side? Other organizations that seemed to coalesce with you? Well, there was uh, CFAM, Catholic Families, uh, Family Watch International, there's several NGOs that are very pro-family, pro-life that were working with us. Uh, as far as countries, who would you say? Countries that were on our side? Uh -huh. or Well, as you mentioned, African a lot of the African nations. countries. It's amazing how many of the African nations were, were uh, not only with us, but excited that they were surprised. Not only, the, well, let me back up. They were with us, they were surprised, and then they were even more surprised that college students from America were promoting these ideas. Hmm. Because most people believe outside of the United States that if you're young and you're from the United States, you're not going to believe in the traditional family or at least in this heavy individualistic mentality because we are an individualistic society. I mean, we're Western culture, so. Good dropping off point for your university students. Who did you bring with you? We're looking at a picture of the, con the uh, contingent here. Who, uh, not individually by name. But, oh, I uh, see. Um, I had five of my students from BYU Idaho, and um, they've all been they've all taken a course from me, Child and Family Advocacy. They've all been involved in advocacy in some way, um, blogging, going to city councils, going to the state ca state capitals, 
Um, so I wanted to make sure I brought a crew that was professional, articulate, and polished, and they were, they were phenomenal. They were awesome. That's quite an internship. Yeah, yeah. it was yeah. pretty awesome. Now, g give me some idea of the routine of your day. Who, how did you approach people? Where did you speak? What did you give them? Well, our goal as we were mingling among other NGOs and delegates and people around the conference room itself was to make friends, make a friend. Get to know people, share your thoughts and our research and our, our resources with them. But we also had some formal meetings as well. Yeah, so we, we met, set with some mission visits. The first one I went to, I brought with a student with me and uh, another person who was with United Families International. We met with Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. And right now they have a civil war going on. Yeah. And this man had just flown in. I mean, he was still in a t-shirt and jeans. Um, English is his native tongue, or not sorry, French is his native tongue. He didn't speak English very well. So we were doing a lot of sign language, even though we don't speak sign language. You know, we were kind of gesturing quite a bit. But we were able to communicate to him what we were there for. He told us about the civil war going on in his uh, country. We talked to him about abortion and other things that uh, were pertinent to this commission on the status of women. But just to hear this man talk about uh, families getting separated with guerrilla warfare, people coming into villages with guns and moms and children getting separated, and it's pandemonium and they still can't find their children. Mothers can't find their children and children can't find their mothers. Talked about rape taking place in all of this warfare. And just, and this man had four or five children himself and he hadn't seen them in a while just because he'd been doing delegation stuff. It was heart-wrenching and it made me be so thankful for the country I live in and he was so optimistic and so genuine that when we shared the stuff that we had for him to help him discern and dissect what was happening on at the United Nations and that document, extremely grateful. In fact, he said, can we have a follow-up appointment? And we, we set one. I didn't go back, but we tried to get a French interpreter for us so we could connect more. I saw in the in the writings of, from the chair and in the draft letter, the draft uh, agreement that was put out there for the commission, a lot of talk about violence against women. I am curious, are we talking about uh, what type of violence? Because there were many countries there that were Islamic countries. There's a big debate in this country. There was a speaker who, who spoke too openly about that, was invited to Brandeis University and then disinvited because she emphasized uh, some of the oppression that uh, Islamic women, Muslim women, are under. What was the mood about that there? Well, there was a big discussion about forced child brides. Mm. Um, so we know that some countries certainly have a problem with that. Now, how did the commission characterize life in the United States? Did it get special treatment for being oppressive? Curious. Is there an anti, I, I guess what I'm asking, was there an anti-U.S. bias, which can typically happen in those meetings? Mm -hmm. I didn't sense that. At I didn't detect one. that either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, Tim, you gave a, you talked particularly about uh, women to a group uh, mm -hmm. in particular. You talked about daughters. We're going to talk to Tim about that uh, on Utah Matters when we come back. Tim Rarick from BYU-Idaho, but with United Families International, and taking a bunch of students with you to that UN conference on the Commission of Status of Women. You had a chance to have a captive audience, mm -hmm. well, somewhat captive, <laughs> set up where your audience came from and, and talk about what you talked about. Well, there was probably over 100 women in attendance, wouldn't you say, mm -hmm. at this one event. And I was the fourth speaker of, of four speakers. Laura was the first one that set it up and set the tone. We were really trying to, the purpose of the event was to help women or girls become successful women and using social science research and, and, and such to help create that mindset. Now, right. now before you go there, those attending were in people, delegates that you invited and were able to persuade to come? They were mostly leaders from NGOs okay. and UN visitors. Okay. And I don't know if I met one American in that event. Mm. It seemed like they were really from all over the world. So. Uh, my speech, I spoke on fathers raising daughters because I never heard anything about men there other than negativity. In fact, I remember seeing on a billboard and on a bus that the phrase, all men must die. And I think there were some women who really believed that. Uh. 
And I, so I have three daughters myself, so I thought I would use anecdote with social science research and can, that can be a very powerful combination. So I went through society and talked about how father, fatherlessness is becoming more and more prevalent and what's happening, the ripple effect, uh, and then the unique contribution that involved fathers, not just fathers who are paying the bills, but emotionally involved fathers, what they can do for their daughters, the unique contribution that they make. Um, I interwove it with my own personal experiences, t talking about that, for example, um, the foundation for relationships that women have with men comes from fathers, or the lack thereof. So I have three daughters, and I said, I think I mentioned in the speech, I want the first date my girls go on to be with me. Be with you. I want them to see how a guy should treat them. I want them to discern certain things and, and say, this is how you should be treated. And um, So I was really saying fathers step up around the world, and I got pretty emotional because it's a very, it hits close to home. And so did the audience. It was beautifully received. The audience yeah. were wiping away tears and yeah. standing ovation afterwards and running up and asking, can you come to our country? Can you tell our people your message? This is so important. He was an international rock star <laughs> for giving this message to these people. They were hungry for it. It was wonderful. One of the things you said was that men are more than fathers and more than just assistant moms. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, assistant mom, sometimes we look at men as, as long as they're the breadwinner uh, and helping provide for their three square meals and a roof, and that's fine. Um, and let's let the nurturing all just be the moms. Fathers have a critical role in uh, disciplining, and I don't mean just punishing, because that's only one form of discipline. I mean disciplining, which to me implies patience and teaching. The more a father can do that uh, with his daughters and his sons, the better they are to a develop their own self-control, which is what we all want all parents want. We want our children to grow up to be self-sufficient and be able to control themselves when they're away from us and make wise decisions. Fathers also help contribute to um, emotional regulation in a way that mothers don't. Mothers, I mean, I, I, and I take nothing away from mothers because we all know that the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world, in my opinion. Um, but fathers do make a unique contribution. And I won't get into the brain structure and the prefrontal cortex and how fathers help regulate those emotions, but they do have a critical role, and that's just one thing that they can do. You're talking do. about research, not just an opinion. What's that? You're talking about research and not just an opinion. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's uh, loads of research out there that um, the gender of the father and his, his uh, unique contributions matter to each individual child in that family. We talk a lot about as we close this segment, we talk a lot about the fatherless homes in America, which is what, about 40%? Uh, Correct me on that. Uh, well, it's one in, three, or one in three children are growing up in a home without their biological father. And nine in ten Americans believe that this is a problem. I, don't, I wonder who the tenth one is. Yeah. So. Uh, and what's it like in Western Europe? Do you have any idea? I, just vaguely, I can tell you that what I've read, and I haven't read it extensively, is that their situations, they're a little further down the road as far as being worse than ours is. Very good. I will be back in our closing segment to ask you to the sort of the question of the day in this country uh, when we come back on Utah Matters. In our closing minutes, there is a wave in this country uh, that is in the courts and legislation is turning to same-sex marriage. What is the best case that you can make, that you made, at the UN to support traditional marriage? Well, when I was speaking on the father-daughter relationship, I was fully anticipating a lot of opposition because we hear that every, I heard several times while I was there that four hands is better than two hands, any four hands, two moms, two dads, mom and a dad. And I have a father who's, one of his legs is amputated. And uh, I think it's his right one. I should know that for sure. <laughs> and I, I, I was fully ready to say, well, did they f equip him with another left one so he'd have two left feet? And I say, yeah, well, one foot, you can stand upright with one foot. It's difficult with support. Two feet's more stable, but a left and right foot are the most stable and the most complementary. And there's a book by Leonard Sachs who just does some phenomenal research and summarizes that men and women are different to the core, and we have been since the womb. 
and it's sad to see that legislation is trying to say that we're the exact same. Mm. As long as we act in a way, our brains are different, even our eyes and ear structures are a little different. And so he's, in his book, he's saying that we need to educate boys and girls just a little bit differently because they learn differently. But and if you ask children what they want, they will say, I want a mom and a dad. Do you feel like you're just a little bit of uh, sand against the giant wave at this point? Do you see any turning back at this point? You know, it's amazing what one voice can do. One voice can help other people think. Laura Bunker and Tim Rarick from United Families International who were recently at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank we you for having it. us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Utah Matters this week. We will see you next week. Mm -hmm.